Good evening, ladies. Although it's not so beautiful outside, I'm so thankful that God has prepared a beautiful night for us. He had each one of you in mind. So I know we've prayed, but I'd like to pray over the word that I'm going to share. So if you'd bow your heads a moment. Father God, I praise you because you have prepared our hearts, our souls, and our minds to receive your word. I praise you because your word tells us that you are in our midst. I ask that tonight you would settle the Holy Spirit over my mouth, that only words anointed from you would flow through me. I ask that each woman here tonight would sense your presence very near to her. Thank you for your love for us. In your name we pray, amen. So the last several months, I've read many articles, looked at some social media, hopefully not too much, did some research, and I have found that trying to find, define love is a little bit like trying to rope the wind. So what is love? Some of us have learned about love through music, movies, and the culture that we live in. In 1942, I know none of us were born yet, but in 1942, Etta James belted out a tune, At Last. She sang of her love having come along, that her lonely nights were over, and love was just like a song. Sounds good. Is love like a song? In 1973, Barbara Streisand starred in the movie The Way We Were, and she sang the song Memories. Is love supposed to be a memory? In 1979, Jay Giles band wrote, Love stinks. <laughs> Is love bad? In 1992, Whitney Houston sang, I will always love you. Is love forever? Beyonce and Jay-Z. Our current culture calls Beyonce and Jay-Z the it couple, the couple that's destined to be. Beyonce sings a risque song about being drunk in love. Is love distorted? In an August 2020 article by Very Well Mind, love is defined as a set of emotions characterized by intimacy, passion, and commitment. Is love emotions and behaviors? Culture has taught us all kinds of love, but the problem is that culture's definition of love competes against itself, and it is constantly changing. When we define love with cultural norms, we twist the meaning of love to fit our human desires. We, you and me, us humans, we're limited in our view of love. We most often see the love only directly in front of us, I like to call this horizontal love. It's directly in front of us, in our vision, like the sunset. Why is it dangerous to view love from our human limitations? As we saw in our reading this week, when we love from an earthly view, or horizontally, love is based on a need. The need for intimacy, the need for companionship, the need of support. Culture conditions us, especially girls, to long for the emotional experience of love. We ask love to meet a need that our human limitations cannot possibly fill. Even the most loving person will come to the end of their ability to love if we do not love from a vertical love, from being loved vertically first ourselves understanding the love the Father unconditionally pours down on you vertically. So where do we go from here? Do we use human knowledge to learn about love? In our chapter this week, we were reminded or we were taught four Greek words that help us to see four different types of love. Eros, romantic love. Have you ever read the Song of Solomon from the Bible? Steamy, girls. It is a steamy book. God created love, and the Bible does not shy away from the reality of physical passion. 
The scriptures elevate physical love when experienced within God's boundaries. What gal isn't romanced by Song of Solomon 6.6? 6. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep coming up from the washing. Each one has a twin, and none of them are missing. <laughs> All kidding aside, Eros love is romantic and beautifully created by God. Filial love is defined as a brother-sister type of love, the kind of love you share with your peers. Think of your dearest friend and the bond you share. The deep friendship we see in the word between Jonathan and David. They teach us about filial love. They shared a bond, and they kept each other safe. If you were able to attend our United event, you heard stories from some of the women about how they have bonded with other women in the group, and they're now sharing life together. We've heard about women who came in alone on a Tuesday night or a Thursday morning, and now some of these sisters are their closest friends. They are experiencing filia love. Storge. Storge love is natural, instinctive, protective, love that can withstand hardship and trials. This kind of love is steady and sure. It's love that arises easily and endures for a lifetime, like the love of a child or a grandchild. Are there any grandmas out there? Grandchildren and Storge love. I have a sweet little granddaughter, Lenny. She is two. We all know two-year-olds. When she drops, breaks, or spills something, she will look at me and say, what do? <laughs> it always brings a smile to my face and a tug on my heart because I know she understands the safety of love. She's trusting me to help her understand what has happened and what do we do to get it taken care of. In the simplest of terms, I pick up her mess, clean up the spill, bandage her ouchie, give her a hug, and off she goes. You're good to go, baby girl. She's off to play. Storge, love. Natural, instinctive, steady. And then we get to agape love. Agape is a word used to describe the love of God. The love God has for you and for me. One of my favorite definitions of agape love is this. God's agape love for us is unconditional, selfless, active, sacrificing, tireless, persistent, reckless, and unending. The English language does not have the word to express my gratitude for a Savior who loves us like this. Remember the story of my granddaughter Lenny and my example of Storje? As beautiful as this story, as this story is to me, it comes nowhere close to the agape, the agape love that God has for you. Let's talk about that for a minute. God's agape love longs to do for you what I did for my granddaughter, but on a much grander scale. No matter the mess, ladies, he can handle your what do? <laughs> he longs to show you how to right the wrongs, how to let go of things that aren't yours to carry, and to say to you, his baby girl, it's okay. Get up, baby. I've got you. I'm right here. Sisters, you never have to wonder if your mess is too big or if God will be there when you need him to be there. The truth is, how God loves you and me has nothing to do with you and me. Agape love is a decision regardless of an emotion. Sisters, this is worth repeating. Agape love is a decision regardless of an emotion. Think of your last disagreement with someone. Did you argue to make your point known? 
Did you argue to win? Did you make a decision regardless of an emotion? Or did you let your emotions rule you? Agape love is not ruled by emotions. God's word shows us repeatedly that he loves us because that's the truth of who he is. God most loving. 1 Corinthians 3.16 tells us love rejoices with the truth. Christ alone knows the full truth of who he is, what he has created, the truth about who we are, where we are, and the work he is doing in us. God's agape love for you won't let go. Ladies, we've talked about what culture teaches us about love. We've talked about the four Greek words for love. Now let's dig deeper into God's word and see what he has to tell us about love. If you have your Bible, feel free to open it to Psalm 86, 15. But you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in truth and faithfulness. Sounds very nice, but what does it mean? What does it mean to me? Let's first look at compassionate. Through the story of scripture, God has promised and proven to be compassionate. Imagine this. The creator of the universe is moved by our suffering. He is compassionate toward us in our suffering. He is ever-present with us. He has promised never to leave us or forsake us in our suffering, whether that suffering be physical, mental, or the emotional pain of his children, his girls. Next, God has promised to be gracious. He is kind, pleasant, merciful, and forgiving. He is slow to anger. He does not have a flashpoint temper. God is faithfully, consistently loyal to his children, his girls. And lastly, abounding in love. Not just loving ladies, he is abounding in love. Psalm 86.15 was written by David. David was not afraid to show his emotion to God. He understood the love of his father. David knew if he cried out for help, God would hear him. So David humbled himself before the father, and through prayer he reminded God of his attributes. David took his eyes off what he could see, and he looked to God. David moved from horizontal love, seeing what was right in front of him, and moved to vertical love, looking to God and his faith for understanding. 1 John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who has been born of God knows love. Again, that sounds nice, but what does it mean to me? What does it mean for me? Dear is defined as someone regarded with deep affection, someone who is cherished. When John uses the word dear in this scripture, he is showing us agape love for the believers. He's showing us a love like Jesus. Sisters, if you're struggling to feel loved, I want you to know, actually God wants you to know, that he thinks of you with deep affection. He cherishes each one of you here. It's not for the sister next to you or down the aisle from you. It's directly for you from him. In a sermon several weeks ago, Pastor Doug said, when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. Can you imagine that? This is agape love, a decision regardless of an emotion. 
This verse also tells us that love comes from God. Love isn't something that can spring up from the goodness of my heart or your heart. Apart from God, we have no goodness in our heart. Love comes from God. As we begin to learn about or grow in our knowledge of our Father God, we begin to understand his love for us at a much deeper level. We stop looking at what is humanly in front of us, horizontal love, and we start to look up to see what God has for us, vertical love. In her book on page 38, Jen says, right love of God is what enables right love of self and others. Restoring the vertical relationship, my relationship with the Father, is the first step to writing the horizontal relationship, my relationship with self and with others. I don't know about you ladies, but sometimes my relationships get, shall we say, a little sideways. Maybe I'm tired, maybe I'm just grouchy. When I struggle in relationships with my husband, my family and friends, I'm reminded that I need to get plugged back into my source of understanding. I need time alone with God. Somewhere in the busyness of life, I chose to crowd him out. Sisters, there is no substitute for time alone in the word with just you and God. Please write that down. There is no substitute for time in the word with just you and God. The deeper we go, the more the Holy Spirit is able to give us an understanding of agape love. I was blessed to truly experience God's agape love for me and my family 366 days ago. I didn't know it at the time. I could hardly put two thoughts together and I didn't have an understanding of agape but I knew I needed my savior. I needed the lover of my soul. 366 days ago, my oldest son overdosed on heroin. As I vacationed in Florida, my son was in the fight for his life. Many of you have heard this story, so we're not gonna linger here, but if anyone is struggling in this area or you love someone who is struggling in this area, I'm happy to pray with you when we close tonight. What I want to focus on is love, the agape love that God surrounded me with before I was even aware of what it was. What kind of love is that? I always choose Spectrum Hospital. We all have our favorites, right? I choose Spectrum. But Michael was brought to St. Mary's. Why? When I look back on it now, I know it was God's agape love for my son. God's love for Michael was not based on an emotion or a behavior. God's love was, God's love for Michael was and is unconditional, just like his love for you ladies. It's unconditional. Michael was greeted by the senior respiratory therapist, the therapist at St. Mary's with the most knowledge who was not supposed to be working was there. Sisters, that was not a coincidence. That was God's agape love for Michael. My flight home had no issues. It included lovely flight attendants who got me off the plane first to ensure that I made my connecting flights. Again, agape, God going before me and clearing the way. I am sorry to say that many people don't have any form of love for people with substance issues. But God, he was working. You see, ladies, the doctor who saw Michael, he had a heart for my son. He told me a few years prior, his son had overdosed. What kind of love is that to put that doctor in front of Michael? Why was Michael taken to St. Mary's, I asked. God answered with agape. God also put two beautiful women in place to walk with me daily, hourly, minute by minute. 
For almost two weeks, Michael laid in ICU on a ventilator. These women surrounded me and carried me when I couldn't get myself off the floor. They answered my call no matter what. Jen states in her book on page 36 that agape love is both the way God loves us and the way we are to love each other. I am so thankful that these women all through their lives thought the, sought the wisdom of God and were able to shower me with his agape love. Oh, that we would be blessed to shower others with his agape love. I have six grown children with six adults. Let's just say there can be differences of opinions. <laughs> lively, loud discussions. What God showed me through them was beautiful and pure. I watched as they put aside any barrier they might have had, and they bonded together in prayerful warfare for their brother. It was truly a blessing to behold. Although I would never choose that experience, my heart learned and still yearns for the closeness of God's agape love. One more verse, ladies. Zephaniah 317, a verse I have come to love over the last few months. The Lord your God is in your midst. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Let's just soak in that for a minute. Soak seems to be a word that God wants us to hear tonight. And I think he is here for us to soak in his presence. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Shut out any distractions. As I read this verse again, I'm going to ask you to put your own name quietly at the end. For example, the Lord your God is in your midst, Debbie. Take a deep breath. Breathe in Jesus. Breathe out the junk of the day. Ready? Close your eyes, please. The Lord your God is in your midst. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Thank you, Jesus. Sisters, your God is mighty. We don't have a wimpy God. We have a mighty God. His love for you is beyond words. He is fearsome. He is ferocious. He is big and he is tough. He longs to rescue you from harm, to keep you safe. He delights in you. He enjoys you. He will quiet you with his love. God, the creator of the universe, wants to quiet your soul to calm you, to make you secure by freeing you from uncertainties. He wants to give you rest and shelter with him. Joyce Meyer stated that if you ever want to know how much God really loves you, think on Zephaniah 3.17. Zephaniah 3.17 translated in Hebrew excuse me, gives us the image that God literally spins around with joy over you. He's not just standing idly. He is spinning around with joy over you. He, and he not just sings, he shouts over you. Each one of you here tonight, he shouts over you with joy. God has not only saved you from his wrath through Jesus, but he delights in you. As you close your eyes to sleep tonight, believe this. The Word of God tells us that the Creator of the universe is rejoicing over you with singing. Dear sisters, we have talked about how culture can influence or warp the way we understand love. We have talked about how we can use four Greek words to describe different types of love. 
and we have gone to his word. His word is our one true source for life. His word in Zephaniah 317 has painted a beautiful word picture of how much the Father loves you. God loves us, you and me. He loves us so much that he sent his son to die, not just for our past, but for our present and for our future. Sisters, the book of Zephaniah also speaks of judgment on Jerusalem and Israel. It speaks of justice and it speaks of love. God didn't want to destroy his nations. He wanted to purify them. In the book of Zephaniah, God tells us that nothing will be hidden from him. Nothing will be hidden. All sins will be revealed by the Lord so that people can be awakened, healed, and set free. God wants us you and me, to wake up, ladies, be healed, and be set free. We can no longer look at things horizontally. Each one of us tonight are in different places in our walk with God. Hear me when I say this, please. There is no shame in the place you are with God. No shame. God will bless your efforts as you seek him. In Christ, we will gain a healthy understanding of who he is and how much he loves us. Remember, that's not just for the sister next to you. That's for you as you sit in your seat. In Christ, we will move from earthly vision and understanding, horizontal love, to a heavenly realm in Christ, understanding, seeking him for our future. Think about this. When we raise our arms to praise the Lord, we are taking our eyes off this world and we're moving up into a heavenly realm as we praise. Let's pray. Father God, I praise you because you are a heavenly Father who loves us, adores us, no matter what. I praise you because your word tells us that we are your beloved daughters. Forgive us when we look to culture or anything else to define ourselves. Thank you for the time that you have given us tonight. Thank you for your word. Give us the desire to seek you daily, moment by moment. Teach us to love as you love. In your name we pray. Amen. Ladies, I'm going to ask you to stand while we close. Many of us know the song, Reckless Love. When asked about the lyrics, the songwriter, Corey Asbury, said that God saw him, a broken down kid with regret as deep as the ocean. His innocence and youth poured out like water. He said that God kept showing up on the doorstep of his heart when he least expected it time and time again. God found him. He put him on his shoulders and he carried him home. As this song begins, if you feel led by the Holy Spirit, if you have never met Jesus, come. If you long for a renewal of faith, please come. A fresh awakening, come. If God is nudging you, leading you, calling you, or chasing you down, please come to the altar. I invite you to step into the aisles as we sing and come forward in response to him. I invite you to come home to the love of your Father God. Amen.